right, let's go ahead and delve further into 2020 with four more releases, um, which aren't near as bad as you would think January would bring, with the exception of one. So uh, let's go ahead and start with uh, Bad Boys for Life, which is Bad Boys 3. Because there was the weird thing where they were going to do like three and four close together, and the fourth one was going to be four life, and this one was just going to be three, but... I guess they wanted to see how. I guess they wanted to use that title, and they weren't sure how this one was going to go. But something tells me that they're going to be just fine uh, when you look at the box office right now, <laughs> um, which is good for them, by the way. And the thing that was a little, this is like one of the only cases ever where you can say Michael Bay's not involved, so I'm not sure how I feel. <laughs> Um, because his style really suited uh, those first two movies so well. And ba Bad Boys 2 might as well be, like, the Michael Bay playbook <laughs> when you look at everything in it. And this one had a lot of promise because uh, for a while there, Joe Carnahan was attached to it, who had done Smoke and Aces. But more appropriately for a movie like this, he did Narc which I thought was really exciting when he was attached to this, and he's still got, like, a way down here writing credit, but it's now in the hands of two directors that I've not heard of prior to this, which was also kind of worrying, but the thing about this movie is that... And I, I really like those first two movies. Um, I, I really like the first movie, and I've seen it at least a hundred times. And the second one, while a bit overblown in cases uh, I, I still like pretty well i just watched it again like last week uh kind of in preparation for this i guess and it's and it's still you know those movies are like the one of the crowning examples of movies like this and how to do them right and well just the whole balls to the wall action thing and but even so with that opinion in mind i say that I'm still kind of shocked that this movie is able to pull off as much as it pulls off. Because there there are a lot of things in this movie that probably should not work, yet somehow they do. And, like, starting with the whole thing, uh, obviously they're getting older, so that might be, you know, a joke that gets used one too many times. And so we have the thing that feels, like, age-old now. Like, I can't even give you an example off the top of my head, but I feel like I've seen this a billion times already. I'm sure it's probably in a couple of Fast and Furious movies or something. But the opening scene being this giant car chase that looks like it's right out of the first movie. And it's this old big action scene, and they're back and forth, and we're seeing everything just like we used to, and everything's here just as it was. And it's great, and it's comforting going into the movie knowing that okay, the chemistry is going to be just fine, the action is going to be just fine. But then, of course, the big punchline is they were racing to the hospital the whole time because Marcus's grandson was being born. Uh, and so it's like, uh, okay, well, we've... I feel like we've seen that <laughs> uh, many times before. And it's like, so it's going to be one of those movies, I guess. It's going to be, like, the Lethal Weapon 4 thing where it's like you look at the first Lethal Weapon and how, like, brutal it was. And then by the time we get to Lethal Weapon 4, the last line is we're not friends, we're family, and it's it's that thing. It's always the fucking family thing in all these franchises. <laughs> but this one actually finds a way to make it work, and there's even, I think one thing that helps also is the uh, surprise returning character in this scene from the second movie. Uh, it was, there was a really pleasant surprise to run into again, but the thing about these movies also is that their villains have been okay, but there's not really a whole lot to them usually, so it's like, I wonder if this one got um, a somewhat more memorable villain, perhaps. Um, not that, um, I mean, Fouché and uh, Johnny Tapia are good villains within those movies, but they're not necessarily something that you, like, fully take away from that movie. So it's like, I wonder if we'll get, like, a really good, memorable villain in this one. Um, and this dude, when we first see him... My, like, my first thought in my head was, well, who is this tool? Uh, but then, shortly after that introduction, we get a scene of him being confronted. He's got a gun in his face, and with this gun in his face, this impending threat, he manages to kill five people around him with just a knife. And it's like, alright, this guy looks like a formidable threat. <laughs> let's, uh, let's see how this goes. And yeah, he is like this really... Like, there's just... 
it, it, at the very beginning, he's obviously got his mother who's giving him orders, but it's the whole thing where she's saying, you know, you have to kill this person and then this person. And it's going to be like, it seems like this whole movie's worth of a kill list, and we just get it in montage form because he's that good <laughs> and that smooth. Um, and then, of course, the person at the end of this kill list is uh, Mike Lowry. So that is eventually where everything crosses paths. And, yeah, and, and, it's, and it's a pretty decent setup uh, story-wise and really sets up the action in ways where it doesn't feel like... Like, I, I guess there were instances in the second movie where it was like, oh, so this little thing resulted in this giant action. It's like every single little thing set off an action scene. <laughs> Um, and re really, honestly, the only action scene that I think is maybe we didn't necessarily need it in the second movie is the shootout in the Haitian house. That probably could have just been an interrogation scene, but, um, like the scene, the stuff at the end and all that, when everybody, you know, starting to get restless, I loved all that stuff. So, but yeah, and this one doesn't really, the action scenes all kind of come in smoothly. So, uh, that was a plus also, but then... There's something else that's kind of unexpected in this movie, and it's something where I feel like, I guess because just the rapport between them just kind of is, just works so well, is it's like, if another movie had tried to be as dramatic as this movie ends up being, it probably would have felt a bit misplaced and like they were maybe trying a little too hard to do the character thing, and you, and if you're going to do that, you have to do it well, and that's usually where it's like, like, you can appreciate that it's there and that people try, but it doesn't usually come through in the way they're hoping it does, or at least as strongly. But with this one, when Martin Lawrence and Will Smith has to have to hit those dramatic beats, they do it so authentically that you get so caught up in it that it doesn't even necessarily feel out of place in what is essentially this really big action comedy. Because um, when the dramatic points hit, they, like, really hit because of the two of them. And it's, like, the fact that they have to, like, legitimately, like, act and have, like, dramatic scenes. It seems like it would be so misplaced. There's so many things in this movie where I feel like if I just explained it to somebody, it would make the movie sound terrible. But when, the way, when you see the way they pull it off, it actually works. <laughs> Um, that is, that's especially the case for, uh, some story turns later. But, to the point that Martin Lawrence himself even compares the story turns to a soap opera. And they're appropriate. Yet, somehow in the movie they still work. It's, it's crazy. Uh, <laughs> but the great thing about, uh, Marcus's character in particular is it probably seems like a bit of a cliche where... You have the partner that's the loose cannon and the other partner that wants to retire, and there's that sort of combating thing. But the thing about it is that this has been... We've been leading to this with Marcus's character through, like, the whole three movies. So it almost feels like when he actually, like, attempts to go the retirement route, it's actually just, like, his arc kind of finally coming around, uh, rather than just, like, some story point to do whatever they're going to need to do. And it does seem like... It's another cliche where it's, okay, if Marcus is going to go into retirement, something ha something drastic enough has to happen to get him into retirement. And then something else drastic enough has to happen to get him out of it. And both of those moments come without feeling forced. And, and, it's, and then also, um, you would think that of all people... Um, it, it would be Marcus that has the more dramatic moments because we've been seeing how, like, in the first movie, he was the one with the family, and, you know, Mike was the exact opposite. And then by the time I got to the second one, he was doing the whole therapy thing and the woosaw thing, and then it's like, by the time he's, like, full-on ready, like, absolutely positively ready to retire now in this one, it actually feels like we naturally got there, and it's not just some, you know, character turn to make whatever happens happen. But... What, the dramatic stuff that Will Smith has to do also, because you would never really get a sense that, that Mike would be at the levels of, like, like an emotional level that he is in this. And once again, in a lesser movie, and with characters that we maybe don't know as well, it, wouldn't, it would seem very out of place um, that this character suddenly hitting these emotional beats. But what has happened in the first part of this movie, because I don't know what people already know about this plot and what they don't. Um, 
but what happens in like the first section of this movie really sets off like a a tonal change in Mike's character, but at the same time it's yeah, he's definitely still in there and he's definitely still like the unstoppable wanting to do the vigilante shit uh kind of character, but he's he's sort of like restrained in a certain way that we haven't seen him before in a way that he, at some point, when he's trying to convince Marcus, and he's pretty much given no choice but to just kind of either do what Marcus suggests or go it alone, and there's like a real dilemma here that kind of transcends it being a cliche setup. And that's, and yeah, I don't know how they pulled that off, but they did. Um, and then I was really happy to see... Uh, the returning presence of uh, Joe Ventoliano as Captain Howard, and I also really because when I saw he returned, I was like, well, I hope I hope he gets like more than just a couple of scenes or something, like maybe just a couple of scenes of yelling at them or whatever to show that he's back, and then that'll be it. But I was really happy with like how much screen time he has, <laughs> um, and how important his character ends up being. So that was uh, really refreshing, also. And he's got some really good scenes, also. Like there's the one moment where he's like, you know laying out this story or whatever to Mike, uh, and it's actually this really great sort of symbolic, dramatic moment or whatever. Um, and we do have some new characters. And once again, no idea how they pulled it off, because this is where another movie would fail miserably, and that is bringing in the young team. Um, so they've got the other team. With, he, he, Mike calls them the high school musical team, which, of course, that means Vanessa Hudgens is part of this. Um, and Alexander Ludwig from, uh, he was the villain in the first Hunger Games. And these characters are so, like, you, you would think they were just all the young characters, and they, you know... And yeah, there is the back and forth between him being the old guy and them being the new, younger people. Um, but much like his scenes with Martin Lawrence, it's like, you would think this would be stale. But it's not, because everybody is, you know, like, everybody brings their A-game to this. <laughs> Um, so there's nothing stale between him and Lawrence, and there's nothing stale between him and the younger group. The Alexander Lewis character especially is really funny because they kind of do the uh, subverting of expectations thing where you think he's going to be like the hot-headed one and the one that Mike butts heads with, but he's actually like the sensitive one that says, like, you know, if I'm going to have to kill anybody, I'm definitely going to, you know, need to make sure I get some therapy. <laughs> and that, So that was uh, kind of a nice turn. That. And Vanessa Hudgens doesn't really get much to do. She's mostly just kind of there. Um, but that whole aspect of that new team weirdly works. Um, so there is that. As far as, uh, some downsides to it, there really aren't that many. Um, the editing can get a little reckless sometimes, and, like, there is... I mean, the, the whole idea, um, like, the whole style of the movies is, like, you know, erratic editing and all that, but there's also, there are some cases where there's a separation between the erratic editing that makes the action scenes go and gives them their style, but then there's the other side where it's like, some things maybe feel a tad misjointed, but nothing that's too, like, damning or anything, or too obnoxious. Um, and obviously there's going, even though we're not Michael Bay now, that's not to say that My Michael Bay didn't direct it, and he's not a producer or anything, but that's not to say that Michael Bay doesn't play some sort of part, <laughs> uh, which is very funny. Um, but the, even, even with that, there is a shitload of explosions. That was one thing that they were not going to let uh, go with Michael Bay when he wasn't directing this. Uh, no, there are still plenty of explosions, and there are scenes where, you know, there's guns being fired by the good guys during a chase with a lot of bystanders around <laughs> um, in the wrong place. But this is just the kind of movie where you just kind of get over that. And it's it's one of those cases where you can tell whether or not you like the movie in scenes like that. Because if you don't like the movie, you're probably going to get hung up on that and say, this is the most reckless action scene I've ever seen. Why are the good guys firing so much around innocent bystanders? But if you like the movie like I was, it's you just embrace it as one of those movies to where that doesn't matter. Uh, so, um, and that's... So yeah, that didn't bother me. And then it is... It's also one of those movies where I talked about how, you know, badass the villain can be, but at the same time, he is one of those villains where, like, he'll just, he'll kill this dude like nothing, he'll kill this dude like nothing, and then when it comes time to where he needs to kill Will Smith, suddenly he wants to pause all the time and talk rather than actually doing it. <laughs> um, so, so he is one of those villains, but um, it's, it, it's still fine. 
Uh, and like I said, all this stuff started with Michael Bay, so it's like, you just kind of expect that stuff anyway, because it would be, I suppose being new directors, it would it would be subject to criticism if they just sort of copied Bay, but at the same time, it is kind of appreciated when you're doing this, and you kind of want to keep the feel of the other movies. You, you don't want it to feel, too, you want it to feel fresh, but not necessarily too different from the other two either, because then it would be just be kind of jarring and wouldn't necessarily kind of feel in the same way. And the way they were able to not necessarily completely copy Bay, but still make it feel like it's a whole trilogy, um, is they kind of found like that right middle ground. So there's that. Um, we do eventually, finally, towards the end, I was wondering if we were going to get it or not. Um, we do get the shot of uh, something flying over the Miami sign. Uh, which, which I was waiting because it's the opening of the other two movies, and in this one, it's close to the end when they're they're leaving Miami. So that was uh, really happy to see. Also, uh, like I said, it's not necessarily that they have to copy Bay, but they have to keep us in the uh, universe, I guess you can call it. So, and you know, once it gets towards the end, like I said, this when it gets to like the story turns, they shouldn't work as much as they do. Um, like if this, like I can ima I can easily imagine an alternate universe where I, I loathe this movie, <laughs> but I don't at all. <laughs> um, especially when it gets to the end and it's like, really by the, by the time we get to the end, um, and the final fight is happening, it basically feels like we're watching Gemini Man again, like the climax of Gemini Man again. Um, and then there is eventually a, um, a picnic ending that feels very much like, that f those final the final scenes of the Fast and Furious movies where everybody's fucking family and shit and there's like three new people every time uh, that is kind of I mean it's I mean that's somewhat the end of two I guess but I mean this one was like it very much looked like the end of a Fast and Furious movie and where the Fast and Furious movies are lately that's that's not a territory you want to be in you <laughs> but um, yeah and then and I also appreciated some of the callbacks also, because there are callbacks to some jokes in the other two movies, but they're not like constant, and it's to the it's also to where they're not they're not blamed enough to where if you don't remember some of those jokes in the other two movies, it's probably just a line that'll pass you by, and it doesn't necessarily feel like they're using it as any sort of crutch. My I think my favorite one was and it because it took me a second to re realize what he was saying was um, there's a point in time when they're at uh, a basketball game that Captain Howard's daughter is playing in, and she shoots it and she misses, and Captain Howard says, oh gosh, he's got the family curse. And it's like, th that's a callback to the scene in the first movie when they're on the basketball court, and he's, he's, he takes like ten shots, and in the whole scene he never makes one. It's like, I, th I thought that was a nice random callback to that scene, so that's, and so that's the way those are um, throughout it, and they're, those are really appreciated when you know uh, the other two movies really well. So, yeah. I don't know how they pulled this off, but they, like, totally pulled this off. And I was hearing that, like, you know, their chemistry took it a really long way. Like, it, like if the rest of the movie failed, their chemistry would have carried it. But I felt like that was just sort of a plus of it, because the movie is good. Like, like the story and all that. And like I said, even the story turns are seem very outlandish, but at the same time we do just kind of gradually get to that point. And the way that they play it was probably the best way they could have played it. Um, where, once again, I could, I could see myself absolutely hating this <laughs> if I didn't like the rest of the movie. Um, and then, of course, that does immediately set up our fourth one. And I wasn't quite sure because of how much they were playing up, you know, that, like, Marcus in particular seems like he's getting pretty old. He's got to wear the glasses all the time and stuff like that. <laughs> he went through his whole retirement phase, but it's like... Um, you, you when they when movies like this set that up, you tend to sort of roll your eyes, and you'll probably make an Avengers joke or something or whatever. But it was like, yeah, I'm, I might if the if they keep this up, I'm willing to maybe go another round. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how everybody else feels, but uh, yeah, we'll see what happens. Though obviously, without saying too much, um, there will be one character we won't be getting back, and that's gonna be a bummer with another movie. Um, so I don't know if I'm looking forward to that, but, <laughs> but everything else, um, 
sure, I'm interested to see um, what they can do if they keep going. And looking at their box office right now, um, I'm, I imagine it's inevitable <laughs> um, if both of them are game for it as well. So I guess we'll see what happens. But um, yes, that's I'm really happy about that because I was rooting for this movie because I do really like those other two a lot. So, um, yeah, that's nice. Uh, <laughs> so let's go on to Doolittle, uh, which is probably the opposite of a lot of what we just said. Um, <laughs> this is the $175 million movie, I think. We have Robert Downey Jr. playing Dr. Doolittle now. Um, but it's not like the uh, modernized Eddie Murphy thing. We're going back more towards Rex Harrison, but it's kind of... Not really that either. <laughs> it's it's this thing. It's it's an adventure movie that I feel it feels a lot like the adventure movies that I would have seen in theaters when I was a kid in the '90s. And sometimes that's a compliment. Like when I was talking about Togo and the movies it reminded me of. In that sense, it's a compliment. In this case, it's more like those '90s kids movies that you went to solely because you because you basically felt like you had to because it's like your parents were like oh there's a kids movie that's coming out i guess we better take kids to see that and then you watch it and you're like i think i'm supposed to be liking this like i think it was made for me but I, i'm not into this it feels more like those that um that renee that renee russo gorilla movie it's like that so <laughs> where it's like i'll just pretend to like this since we're at the movies and everything <laughs> so, um, this is brought to us by Stephen Gagan, of all people. You know, the guy that won an Oscar for writing Traffic? <laughs> and he wrote and directed Siriana? Yeah, he did He did this. Uh, I don't know why or how that even came about, but he did. So, we get the whole opening. It's this little animated opening, and it's giving us Dr. Doolittle's backstory. And it kind of brought out the darkness in me quickly because uh, you're watching this introduction, it's giving you his backstory, and it's like, and then one day the doctor fell in love with a woman. And it's like, oh, great. So it's going to be one of those, oh, he lost you know, his first love, and that's probably going to come back into this story, and there's going to be some boring-ass love story in the middle of all this other boring shit or whatever. And while I'm thinking this, they go, but she died at sea. And my first thought was, oh, good. <laughs> I don't think that's how we're supposed to feel about that. It's supposed to be his little tragic backstory or whatever. Um, and come back, it comes back later with a king that's played by Antonio Banderas, who I had no idea was in this. Um, but hopefully his Oscar nomination will make people forget that he's in this. So <laughs> he's got that going for him. Um, and then, yeah, so we start off with this kid, of course, who's out hunting with his dad, Ralph Ineson. Um... I don't think the people who are going to watch this are the actual target demographic for Doolittle, so I'm going to go ahead and call him Ralph Ineson from The Witch, uh, so you know who I'm talking about. The guy with the voice, the really cool voice, who's got like 30 seconds of screen time in this. And the kid ends up shooting a chipmunk to appease his dad, and he feels bad about it, so he decides he's going to take the chipmunk to Dr. Doolittle. Something like that. I don't, it's all kind of a blur already. Um, so... <laughs> But, and he, he has to, like, go into the whole thing, and it's a whole journey, and he finds him in seclusion, and it's, like, finding Downey in seclusion. Uh, or it's basically, it's basically, like, towards the end of Zodiac, when Jill and all goes to find Paul Avery on the boat. It's, like, that's basically what Downey's doing again. <laughs> um, so, and he's, you know, he, he's got the whole sort of scruffy, I've been here forever, fuck my life look. Um, just here with all the animals, and then they have to bring him out and go on this adventure to save the queen from a constipated dragon. That's <laughs> that's what the plot is, I think. And it's Michael Sheen, of all people, that wants to use the constipated dragon to kill the queen. And the queen is Jesse Buckley. You know, Jesse Buckley, the breakout actress, whose sole role in this movie is to lay in bed and sleep. So, uh, she pulled a dip in that second Alice in Wonderland movie. That's... <laughs> <laughs> so, a great use of a yeah, rising star like that. Great. And Jim Broadbent is there also. Um, to just stand there. He was he was so insignificant, I couldn't tell for sure if it was Jim Broadbent or not. I was questioning that every time I saw him. It's him, it turns out. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, 
he fought, he has he always finds his way to Queen Victoria apparently. So, um, and of course, this is going to be one of those movies where we have the giant um, supporting cast of recognizable faces doing voices for the animals, which ultimately ends up just being distracting because you're trying to place which actor is which. Um, like Octavia Spencer is doing a Wanda Sykes impression for some reason, and you got John Cena doing a polar bear, and you've got Rami Malek as the gorilla. Camille Nanjiani is the ostrich, and who gives a fuck is this whatever, and doesn't fucking matter is that animal. Um, and that's that's pretty much uh, what the whole movie is. And then it's stuff like it's really like I was talking about it feeling dated. Um, like an early 90s movie that you bore the shit out of your kids with because they're made for kids. Um, there is a line where I think it's Octavia Spencer, because I think she's like a duck or a goose or something, and she says, do you understand the words that are coming out of my bill? And it's like, if there's one thing that is just going to be comedy gold in a movie in 2020, I assure you... It is references to Rush Hour. <laughs> Rush Hour is 22 years old this year. 1998, I think. So, <laughs> that's the kind of lines we have in this from the Oscar-winning writer. So, uh, and then there's a point in time where it's so reckless about itself, um, and this may seem like a small thing, but I mean, like, there's, there's only so many things you have to get right when you're just saying, like, hey, here's an animated animal, let's put a famous voice with it. So, John Cena's the polar bear, and there was a point in time where the polar bear has something in its mouth, and he's talking at the same time, yet Cena's voice is coming through perfectly clear like there's nothing in his mouth. When movies are this shoddily put together and boring, that stuff stands out a lot more <laughs> uh, than it initially would. Um, so there's that. I think the only real, like, voice performances, because it's, it is one of those cases where it's not these actors, these talented actors doing particular voices. I mean, like I was saying, like, I think Octavia Smith was doing some form of Wanda Sykes or something, but apart from that, it's just them, like, they just speak normally. There's, like, no performance here whatsoever. They just are reading lines in their own voices that are just kind of tacked on to these... CGI animals. The only two actors that feel like they're doing something is um, I kind of like Rami Malek as the gorilla. Like I said, he—I mean, he really is just kind of speaking, but he also has a lot of like, you know, gasping and screaming to do. Also, so, so that's that's as close as we're gonna get to like performance here. And then there's a threatening tiger played by. I could just not even say, and you would know exactly who it is. It's Ray Fiennes, because of course it is. And it's like, he he was fine, but it's like, he's just he's just such an obvious choice. It's like, why? It's like, it's hard to even compliment, because it's like, well, yeah, of course. Uh, you can just envision that immediately when you hear it. Um, and that's... And, and yeah, and then there was actually moments that started to bother me, because there were, you, there were clearly stretches. And this, the movie's, like, pretty short. Like, it, it, this had, like, when you look at the production, this had it written all over it. it. It could have been over long. Like, I could see them stretching this out for however long, because that's just what big-budget movies do now for no goddamn reason. But it's only, like, an hour 40, which is really short these which is really short these days, especially when you think about, like, ten minutes of credits. It's basically an hour and a half. So, clearly, they don't have a lot of material for every, for all this big production that they have. So you just kind of got to fill in these blanks. So it's like, let's just have the animals talk to each other. And it's like, I'm not entirely sure how that works. Because not that it's worth analyzing too much, but it's like, first off, the whole concept is that he can talk to animals. So there's something about, there's seems to be no point to these scenes we get where the animals are talking to each other. Um, but we also get this sense that he's like speaking their language. Like, he does this, like, weird thing towards the end, and then the dragon's like, oh, you speak dragon, do you, or something like that. And it's like, so when the animals talk to each other, are they, are they using their own, 
their own voice because we're hearing because apparently what we're hearing from the celebrity voices is a translation and they actually just sound like the animals so i'm not sure how the fuck they're talking to each other it's because it's a kids movie and in kids movies animals talk to each other and they had no more they had nothing else to do so it's like hey um kumail nanjiani do you mind just like bullshitting just into the microphone because we've got some dead air here in the movie and people know your voice you know they hear your voice and they're like i recognize that dude hence this movie is entertaining um so just say some shit and then craig robinson you say some shit and then we'll just put it together and voila we have no more blank spaces in this movie um which inadvertently you're just creating one big giant blank space by making the shit happen in the first place you would have been better off just having downey sitting in silence on the boat because uh, it would have it at least made sense. <laughs> if it it would have this is the kind of movie where it it would have made more sense if nothing happened rather than the shit that happens. <laughs> so uh, that's so that's pretty much what we're dealing with here. Um, and it also we also get stuff where it's like it kind of feels like some stuff might be missing because like it it did feel almost like too like it was suspiciously short. Like I praise it for being short, but it's like it's. It, it, it's it's alarming because you're like why is it so short like if there was more here where is the rest of it and what what is it fucking up by not being here <laughs> so we get this moment and since i saw the movie because it's been a couple of days um i saw a tv spot and it's the shot where he like flips the hat onto his head like it's gonna be like it's like i imagine that's in all the advertisements and it's like it, they're building it up like it's like an iconic Dr. Doolittle look or something. And it's like, once he does this, that means he's back in business or whatever. And I swear to God, <laughs> I don't think he ever wears that hat before this. It's it's like the end. It's like going into the climax, he does that. Um, and it's like, I don't think he wears that hat before this. And I swear to God, after he does that, we never see him in that hat again. <laughs> <laughs> not even in the next scene it cuts to the next scene and they're on the boat and that <laughs> it's just it's just gone <laughs> it's not a thing at all <laughs> yet they made it like this triumphant thing like yes the climax is happening now nope that is not a part of his get up at all <laughs> so there that is they literally just wanted a trailer shot i guess so there's that um, and then, like I said, eventually they work a dragon into this climax because they were out of ideas or something. And that just goes in about the most bizarre direction you could expect. Uh, or not expect, really. So, where is that? So, with all that said, <laughs> as weird and flabbergasting as all that is, this isn't really a movie that I'm mad at. <laughs> It's just kind of boring and unnecessary, really. I mean, it's, <laughs> I mean, it's it's completely and totally senseless that it exists at all. Let alone how much it cost, um, which I'm sure they're going to regret immensely, uh, especially since I think Bad Boys is kicking their ass right now. <laughs> so um, I I don't know, but I don't know how this came to be or why. Here's what needs to happen. Now, I, I wouldn't, like, you know, be arrogant enough to say I know what a multi, multi-millionaire actor should do with his career. But, I mean, I go back and I look at stuff like Natural Born Killers. And it's like, I feel like people should maybe put to rest this idea of because Downey was Iron Man and because, you know, Endgame is the highest grossing movie of all time... Let's keep trying to make Downey happen in leading roles and put his face on posters and bring the kids with you and all that shit. Um, I desperately, like, as soon as Endgame ended the way it did, my first thought was, more Wayne Gale roles, please. <laughs> and more. And you, you can still make him lead a movie. Do, um, do fucking Shane Black movies, you know? <laughs> like, and, you know, do more Kiss Kiss Bang Bang type stuff if you want him to lead, but don't. You don't necessarily... Just because he's fucking Iron Man and was the face of the highest grossing movie of all time, you don't necessarily have to try to make everything he does now this thing that's going to make him, like, 
another franchise or whatever. He doesn't have to be like the multi billion dollar face of movies. Just go back to like the small stuff because that's where like. I mean, can you, because this is the thing that's going to happen, is he's going to keep doing shit like Doolittle, and like maybe every now and then a The Judge, and he's going to be known as the guy that could only do Iron Man and then couldn't carry a movie after that, but it's like, he's so much more than that, it's just those are not the roles. <laughs> it's like, yeah, he can do a chaplain from time to time, sure, but I mean, stuff like Tropic Thunder... <laughs> like, you put him in the su supporting roles, I think, are where he really stands out. And he can still, like, you want him to carry a movie, you know, as the lead in a giant thing here with his face on the poster. He is more than capable of carrying movies and supporting roles. He's done it many times, especially in the past. And it's like, get him more roles like he was doing in, like, the 90s and shit. Um, it's like, I mean, obviously, you know, he's, personally, he's in a totally different place than he was in the 90s. But I am certain he can still do that kind of thing. I'm, I am certain he could do another Wayne Gale type role in his life. Um, so that's just, but they're going to keep trying to make him this family friendly thing. And that's just, I don't know if that's the right direction, but who the fuck am I? And what do I know? But that's just the way I look at it. So I am absolutely 100% rooting for Downey, but I don't think movies like this are going to do it. So... Yes, more stuff like Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, more stuff like Natural Born Killers. I know they, I know they're looking into that third Sherlock movie, and I know people are really into that or whatever. But, and that's fine, I guess. But I mean, it doesn't always have to be the franchise thing. There are so many things Downey can carry just fine, as long as you don't, ha you don't have to throw like fucking two hundred million dollars at it. Otherwise, it's gonna do nothing but harm for his reputation in the long run. Um, and then they're going to have to somehow find a way to resurrect Tony Stark, which would completely kill the um, impact of that whole thing. So <laughs> that would that would suck. So I'm so I'm very much rooting for Downey, but movies like Doolittle just aren't aren't the way to go. I don't think so. Yes. Uh, so let's go on to a couple of releases that I'm a little late on. I think they came out like last week or something. Uh, let's let's go into Underwater. Underwater, which apparently is going to be the very last movie under the 20th Century Fox name. Uh, I guess they're going to be, what is it, 20th Century Studios now. I'm really hoping they still keep the theme and the opening, because it would suck to lose that. Um, but if they do change everything, yeah, Underwater is going to be the last movie that got that treatment. And especially, it's weird when you look at the fact that this was shot in early 2017 so when it was going through all that stuff it kept getting kind of pushed and pushed and you can tell that it was shot that long ago because tj miller's in it and much like the name fox being attached to 20th century fox i'm thinking we pretty much you know deleted tj miller from existence right i hope please for the love of god um in this in this movie shows it's like yeah if this is yes just i, I was never a tj miller fan just throwing that out there. So, um, when this movie starts, um, it really, really starts. I wasn't quite sure what this was. The only thing I knew was that Kristen Stewart had some, like, sci-fi slash potentially horror movie coming out. And I was going to see it regardless because, as I said when I saw Charlie's Angels, I will always do my best to support Kristen Stewart when she does movies like this so that she can afford to do her awesome indie stuff. Uh, <laughs> so, but this one, um was an interesting choice for her also, given that it is, I mean, it's basically an alien movie, and they're not, I don't, I don't even think they're trying to hide it. I think the point is that it's like an, an homage to pretty much almost every alien movie, because it like, not only is it like the opening when we're like going through the hallways of their, you know, station or whatever underwater, um, it kind of looks like, you know, it gives you like Nostromo vibes when we're going through the whole like opening, you know, interior shots. Um, and, and even the structure of the movie feels like Alien. Um, and then you get to the point where she's got the, um, the sort of short hair, like the Ripley haircut from the third movie. Um, and then they got the suits that kind of remind you of the second movie. And it's like, they're trying to hit every single Alien movie in the first 20 minutes. <laughs> um, and that's, so that can probably be a bit off-putting, but like I said, I, I almost feel like that's the point. Um, and then it's like, once we establish, and it's like, this is like a, our homage to this, then we're gonna do what we're here to do. 
And, yeah, unlike Alien, which, um, obviously the first Alien is known for, uh, that really nice slow burn and how long it takes before, you know, the things attached to John Hurt's face, um, this movie starts immediately. Um, and it's like, there's, there's like a little introduction that shows us the interiors, and then it's just sort of Stuart by herself, um, and then, like, hardly five minutes in, if five minutes in, um, the walls are already exploding, and there's supposedly, like, what, like a hundred people in this thing or something, and then by the time this whole implosion of this thing is done, there's six of them. Uh, and that's, and those are the characters throughout the movie. And there's a lot of things that I feel like I want to like this movie more than I actually ended up liking it. Um, mainly for the sake of Stuart, because she's so incredibly talented and still to this day underrated because uh, of fucking Twilight, of course, because um, nobody focuses on anything else, uh, <laughs> that um, I really want as much success for her as she can possibly have. Um, because she can, yeah, she can even carry movies like this, um, where she's kind of got to be... I mean, it kind of sets it up like it's going to be some action thing, but it's really more of like... And there is a difference. It sounds like there might not be a difference. There is a difference here when you think of an action thing versus what it feels like more, which is a disaster movie. Uh, sort of like a um, sign adventure or more recently kind of a Deepwater Horizon type thing. Um, until it kind of eventually gets to the more horror -y aspect. Which even then, it only goes to like... It feels much more like classic horror rather than, you know, modern day horror. Like it, does, it doesn't do the jump scare thing as far as I remember. Um, and a lot of it is, I mean, obviously they're underwater, so it's going to be kind of dark, but the thing that was like, that kind of thrilled me about this movie that I was so happy about was, it's one of those movies where a, lo a lot of people are walking around in the dark, of course, and that's where the movie kind of hits its slumps, where it's like there's a lot of just sort of, you know, walking around and they can't really see shit or what's really going on or whatever, but we, watching it as the audience... Um, it is so much more well lit than most movies like this, where a lot of movies like this, like 90% of this movie would be, what the fuck is going on? Why is it so dark? What am I looking at? Who's dying? Who's in danger? I have no fucking idea. Um, but you can tell, uh, throughout the movie, at least I could, um, what's going on pretty much the whole time, even with what seems to be limited lighting and limited setting. Yeah, and for... I had heard that this is like, um, like the budget was kind of low on this, but for that, the production values are great also, um, particularly the interiors of like the whole thing, like that's, they really, um, like how, how you feel about the production design in something like Alien, uh, they pretty much pull that off without having to like overdo it, because that's the thing here is, the great thing about this movie is it's also quite short. And it doesn't overcomplicate itself at all. Like, in all the ways you expect a movie like this to overcomplicate itself, like, oh, we found this thing, and this thing leads to this thing, and it actually means, and then some stupid twist or whatever. Um, there's not anything like that. There's not really anything they have to figure out. It's just a matter of what they run into and how they're going to deal with it once they've run into it. <laughs> um, is really what the conflict is. Um, and the, I mean, there's... Every now and then there's like a backstory thing that's just sort of to say, be sad when this character bites it, probably. But, <laughs> um, and, and the more they build up a backstory, the more it's like, oh, that person's definitely going to bite it then. Um, but, I mean, apart from that, like, there's no, there's nothing, like, outside of the setting, um, which is, like, really refreshing for stuff like this. Because it's always, there's so many movies that want to have concepts like this, and then they can't commit and they get scared that their audience is going to get bored, so they're like, oh, look, well, we got to do this thing then uh, to get us out of the situation for a second, because this would be too monotonous. And, of course, when they do that, it turns out making the movie even more boring, and this movie avoids that. Um, so, yeah. Um, so I would say the only, the only issue is just... It, it's hard to say because you want to commend it for not really having much to it. Um, but there's also, like... It does feel like it. there's also kind of something missing, like you're kind of expecting just like one more thing, or maybe something that's going to ramp it up just a little more, and that never really comes. So it's this, it's this unfortunate middle ground where I can't tell if that's a good thing, or if 
I did maybe want just a little more. Um, but it is still... I, I almost kind of... They're not remotely similar at all, really. Um, but I was kind of having flashbacks of Crawl also, and the way that Crawl worked, um, where they kind of had the claustrophobic setting for most of it, um, and they more, more or less committed to that. So, um, yeah. But there, it does feel like there's something that's kind of missing, and where we have that middle ground where it's just them, like, the middle portion of the movie where it's just sort of them wandering around. There's a, maybe a bit too long of that. Um, where it's like, the, the movie is 90-something minutes. It probably could have been 80-something minutes. And in that, you could have made it feel, like, much tighter. Um, but still, I mean, props to making a movie like this when we're in cliché land when it comes to movies like this. Um, to be able to start it immediately and not ever complicate itself and just do what it needs to do without trying to blow it up into something else or something more profound or whatever. Um, because oftentimes when people try that, it fails. It's like, be profound all you want, but you got to succeed when you try. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Um, so that's pretty much all that is. I'm really just kind of indifferent to it, but I admire it for, like, what it is and how they pulled it off and without, like, copping out. So, yeah, it's it's fine. It's, it's, it's worth looking into. It's probably... I imagine this is the kind of movie where the advertisements probably make it look like shit. Um, but it's probably a lot better than it looks. So that's probably the best I can say. So let's end on, like, a boss. Because you all know how much I love Tiffany Hash movies. So much. So... This movie proves once and for all that I would think... Tiffany Haddish has quite a fan base. Like, ever since Girl's Trip, it's been, like, just all uphill. But I do think, regardless of her having a fan base, this movie shows that nobody finds Tiffany Haddish funnier than Tiffany Haddish herself. That's the vibe I got, anyway. <laughs> um, and this whole thing is her and Rose Byrne who are, seem like they would be, you know, a really good duo, because Rose Byrne is, like, amazing with comedy. Her performance in Spy is, like, award-worthy. <laughs> um, and great. And she's also kind of, and she kind of showed in Neighbors, it's like, she can kind of find this way of playing, like, the straight man role, but also playing the comedic part, and she can do both, like, at the same time, and go back and forth, depending on which portion of the movie we're in and what is that role is being called for. And she can do the back and forth like that and play the scene straight or be, you know, totally over the top and make it work. And it's great. But when you've got Tiffany Haddish as your partner in this endeavor, um, it's hard to say how far that can go. And I know there are people that just love the shtick. Uh, <laughs> but... It was like, all right, it's a raunchy R-rated movie. Uh, let's see how much Tiffany Hatch is going to take advantage of this. And I'm pretty sure her first line in the movie is, so anyway, I was lathering my titties. It's like, yep, here we go. It's <laughs> all right. Not only is that her first line, it's like the first line of the movie. So it's like, all right, yep, the movie's exactly what we think it's going to be. And I'm sure that's good news for a lot of the people in here, but not for this person. So we get the whole opening and we pretty the the whole opening pretty much lays out the entire movie by laying out the backstory. So it's like they've been friends forever. And we learn this because we see like a montage of high school pictures and it's like, oh they've been friends since they were children and then all through high school and they've been inseparable. And now they live together. They call each other when they get up in the morning even though their bedrooms are just right across the hall. And it's like, oh that's nice. Okay, so before the beginning credits are even over, they're best friends now. They've probably got some wacky side friends. They're going to meet Salma Hayek. This whole problem is going to happen. And let me take a wild guess. They're eventually going to break up with about ten minutes of the movie left. They're going to get mad at each other. Things are going to come out. They're like, I never liked this thing about you. Well, I never liked this thing about you. Oh, our whole friendship has been a waste of time. I never want to see you again. And then they part ways, only to get back together like two minutes later. Because of conflict. Do you think that's going to happen just by looking at high school pictures of them during the opening credits? I would dare never tell you spoilers for, like, a boss. 
So this is another case of Re Rebel Wilson Syndrome too. When I was talking about the hustle, when I was talking about the worst movies of the year of last year, um, it's that Rebel Wilson Syndrome also, where Tiffany Haddish has this thing where it's like the jokes when it comes to her character, characters in other movies too, like that stupid ass Tyler Perry movie from a year or two ago, um, where it's the jokes don't have any particular escalation. The punchline of all the jokes is just her speaking. And that's supposed to be what the comedic payoff is. So, when I say escalation, the example I usually use, because it's a kind of a perfect example of doing that comedy right, is Meet the Parents. The first Meet the Parents. So, and you've got the whole thing where uh, Ben Stiller wants to smoke, so he goes outside and he's he ends up like on the roof and then he reaches for his cigarettes, and then, like, the gutter falls. And the gutter falling is a situation in, in itself, but then it hits the power line. And then it hitting the power line is a situation in itself. Then the power line, like, starts a fire, and then the altar explodes. And it's this whole thing that he just watches happen completely out of his control. Um, and it's like, that's what I mean by a joke escalating. Um, so the idea of escalating and I think another reason that's a good example here is because it's a similar setup because they're smoking a joint and there's like oh no there's a baby in the room it's probably getting high let's go outside so they climb outside and they stand outside the window and it's like oh how's this gonna escalate it's even if it copies meet the parents is it gonna escalate in some way nope that's it they just stand on the roof and then the friends catch them, and then Tiffany Haddish just starts saying things. End of joke. <laughs> that's And that's what the jokes are. Every punchline is Tiffany Haddish says stuff. That's every single fucking punchline. <laughs> and as you can probably guess, that doesn't really go anywhere. It's just Tiffany Haddish, Tiffany Haddishing is what basically every joke is. And then, except for moments where she doesn't necessarily say things. Maybe her mouth will be full at the time. So, we have the ghost pepper scene when Rose Byrne is pissed off at her for a reason I don't remember, and she stuffs ghost peppers into whatever she's eating. And then, she may not, the punchline may not be Tiffany Haddish says shit, but Tiffany Haddish acts as obnoxious as possible. And the more she flails around, like she's entertaining three-year-olds, the funnier the core audience of this movie will find it, I guess. That being Tiffany Haddish's fan base. Her very large fan base. Which, good for her that she found that. But it's obviously not for me. Uh, but it eventually even got to a place where you get some of the side characters like Jennifer Coolidge. And... It's also, like, when the punchline isn't Tiffany Haddish just says stuff, it's Jennifer Coolidge just says stuff that has nothing to do with anything else in the scene at all. It has no connection to anything whatsoever. And I think that's what they think is funny when they wrote it, I guess. Of course, I can't imagine anybody writing this. I imagine it was one of those, it was fucking Apatow syndrome, and goddamn Apatow for starting this whole shit, where it's... Where I'm just going to film you and just say, like, 30 different lines, and we'll pick 10. <laughs> and then the other 20 will be in a gag reel or some bullshit. Um, and, the, and the best part is that none of them are funny out of 30. So, that, so that's what they use Jennifer Coolidge for. And that's, in scenes like that, in the Jennifer Coolidge scenes, it was like, I, I wasn't even I wasn't even able to tell anymore what was even supposed to be funny. Where it's like, I honestly can't tell if she's just saying one of her lines or if that's a punchline. <laughs> I can't tell anymore. Because it's like, she would just say a sentence that had nothing to do with anything, and then there would be a long pause, like waiting for a laugh track. <laughs> and it's like, but... Is that, was that supposed to be a funny line or not? I honestly can't tell. The only thing that's telling me is the long pause where people are just staring. So, and, the, and it's also, it's quite disjointed as well. Not just in that sense, but just the way the scenes are put together. 
because like one comedic scene will be happening and then suddenly we'll be somewhere else and it'll and I I found myself a couple of times in this movie actually thinking in my head wait how did we get here like how did we get to this scene again <laughs> and it's like the movie is the movie's not even an hour and a half it actually is like 80 something minutes and it's like and, and it is so weirdly cobbled together like once again it's like they had no idea what to do with the middle uh, so it's just a bunch of random shit just sort of put together I don't I don't know and once again if all else fails have a character scream what the fuck at something it's like that was like their go to it was like we there's like they had like a stack of what the fuck cards and they were like riding and they were like well here's a situation and it's like how can we make this situation funnier oh wait have somebody scream what the fuck there we go that's great uh mission accomplished for the day or the week or however fucking long they wrote this uh on the on a napkin in fucking 2 hours whichever it was and we even have stuff like I was talking about the rush hour line in Doolittle so it's like in this case we have somebody saying like something happens and everybody's reacting and then one of the women says oh I would totally be reacting right now but I just had Botox it's like wow that's a line you pulled right out of what 2004 <laughs> it's like does that is that even some is that even something people still do I don't fucking know <laughs> there's so many things about this video where it's like I don't know where the fuck that comes from or why but there it is um Billy Porter is trying. I think some I might be trying. <laughs> and there's and obviously you know Rose Byrne, you know, she can more or less do no wrong. She is not entirely unscathed through this. Like in that last five minutes or so, she starts to embarrass herself. But <laughs> for the most part, Rose Byrne can do no wrong. So you know she's trying, I guess. But I mean, it's like. Like, what can you do when your partner in this is Tiffany Haddish, who's trying to do the whole thing? Because, like, there, like, there was the whole thing with Dumb and Dumber, where Jim Carrey insisted on Jeff Daniels, even though the studio tried to talk him out of it, because Jeff Daniels was, like, a serious actor. And, but Carrey knew it was, like, the perfect person to play off of. Um, but could be very funny in his own way. And it's, like... There's not really, like, Carrie would think to do that because he's so skillful about comedy in that way. And it's like, with what Tiffany Haddish is doing, like, what Carrie does in Dumb and Dumber left room for Jeff Daniels to shine as much as he does. And that's just, you can't, there's no room for anybody else here when Tiffany Haddish is on screen just doing her thing and that maybe would get the movie somewhere if it was funny. <laughs> and it never is. Ever. There's like one... Okay, the thing about Tiffany Hash though, is that she does have like... Like, I don't... I just don't think she's funny. And I don't see that changing anytime soon or ever, really. But there is some sort of talent in her that is like there... It's sort of like how I felt like she got really fucked over by the kitchen. Because the kitchen was her opportunity to show, I can do this thing, too. Like, if you don't like my comedy, I can do this thing, too. Um, but that character was just so poorly written that the, the kitchen just completely screwed her over. So I'm still waiting for her to do, like, a dramatic thing um, that works. And I know that Paul Thomas Anderson said something about wanting to work with her. And it's like... I, I will not say that I am completely and totally 100% anti-Tiffany Haddish until I see something like that, where she has a fair shot to do more than just what she does in this movie, which is just obviously her character on Girls Trip amplified. Um, if, you can if you can watch Girls Trip and imagine that character can be amplified, trust me, that character can be amplified. <laughs> um, and that's not good. So... Yeah, so I am more than willing to see what Tiffany Haddish can do with the right material, but material that just says, just do your Tiffany Haddish thing to fucking 11, or even 12 or 13, uh, as opposed to 10. 
I don't think that's going to get her very far in showing what else she can do. So, because there is one scene in this movie where she finally does get to go, like, straight-faced. And it's like, oh, and it's so jarring because it's so different from, like, the obnoxious, the obnoxious this has been the rest of her performance in this. And it's like, okay, there is a talented person here after all. Um, but it's just all these projects that she's in just don't let her show what it's, it's like, it's begging to come out. It's like something like really some real genuine talent is begging to come out. Um, but it just gets buried in this, just do whatever the hell you want shit because we didn't fucking write anything. And, uh, that's, and that's it. And then to make people feel good and like they watch something worth watching for some reason out of fucking nowhere. They just start singing at the end. It's like they do the expected ending where they tell off Selma Hayek, and then they just get on a stage and start singing, and that's the end. <laughs> um, I don't know. So that's what that was. That's what all these were. We're done. Thank Christ. Um, next week is. I don't know. The Gentleman, maybe? Possibly. I don't know. <laughs> but we'll see. Uh, like I said, a weirdly eventful January. When we've got, you know, Bad Boys was a, was a really great start. And then we got Guy Ritchie back in form, apparently, for the most part. Um, so we'll see what else happens. Um, maybe... But I, I, I don't know. Like, I say, oh, maybe we're off to a good start, but we also had, like, a boss in the garage, so I don't know what the fuck's going on. Maybe we'll be nice and balanced through the year. That'd be tolerable. You can't, you know, they're not all going to be winners, but let's find a balance, at least. Let's not have a shitload of, like, a bosses, though. Let's just try to get kind of in the middle and then have, you know, a bad boys or whatever uh, throughout the year. That would be nice. So, yes. So, uh, and that, and then all the award stuff and whatever else is coming. So until all that stuff, I think that's it.